I've been asked to talk about symptom burden, and I think some of you might be thinking I'm going to give you lists of things to do with morphine if you've got renal failure, or what to do about itch, or what to do about depression. Is that the sort of stuff you'd be interested in? <laughs> well, I am not sure that this is going to be the right talk for you because when you look at the whole of symptom management and renal failure, it's a huge area. And uh, I think there's a danger maybe in, in skipping around a little bit. I, I'm going to do some of that stuff. Let, let's, let's see what we can do. Firstly, you've got to acknowledge. Uh, there's lots of acknowledgements. Uh, thank you for, for asking me to come to this day. I've really benefited from it. I was really excited to hear what's been happening in the South. Really excited to be uh, hearing what's happening in Antrim. And mostly excited because seeing two people from different healthcare silos sharing some space together. <laughs> now that's a scary sort of thing. It's a good thing, I think. And it's the thing that we have to do if we're going to really be relevant to the number of patients who are coming our way. If you're working in palliative care, or if you're working in real medicine, I can assure you, your careers are secure. <laughs> Patient numbers are on your side. So thank you. We've also uh, heard a lot about this lady. This is Edwina Brown. A uh, fantastic woman, uh, uh, and I, 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 I write a little bit and I get to edit things. When you get to edit things, you get to read a lot. And so I, I, I had to read this book which I was editing. Uh, and Fliss and Edwina, fantastic, clear stuff about symptom control. So if you're interested in managing depression, or managing uh, heparin in real failure, or if you're that all that stuff. This little book is really good. I get about four TP per copy. But unfortunately, Oxford University Press made it really expensive. It's a really small book, and the rats put a figure of like 30 quid on it. It's stupid. But it's a really useful book in concentrated form, precise on managing symptoms. So I need to acknowledge Edwina and uh, any mistakes are mine, uh, and any references which aren't uh, covered are from this little book. So there's a lot of common ground. I, as I was learning, as I was listening to our, our renal colleagues, uh, often in palliative land, as in renal land, we're referred by others with a variety of expectations. We'll send you for dialysis. We'll send you to palliative care. All sorts of expectations go with that being sent. And some of the expectations are real, and a lot aren't. Then there's complex communication skills cha challenges, which we <coughs> both really face, because we're dealing constantly with uncertainty in a world which likes to be certain. And we're really... Fortunate to have Susie Wilkinson with us, who's going to be talking some about those communication challenges. An individual who has really made it her personal quest to address some of those issues and has probably done more than anybody else in the last 20 years in trying to improve communication. There isn't a universal template. Just as, as you were saying, we treat people, not symptoms. Very different. There's no normal situations. We share uncertainties, and usually we're not the most popular kind of people that people want to see. Uh, my son was at primary school, and he was talking a little bit about uh, what his daddy did. And somebody said, well, uh, I think, I think your daddy looked after my, my granny. She died. And then somebody else <laughs> said, oh, I think, I, think, I think your daddy looked after my uncle. He died too. <laughs> And so somebody said, you're not a very good doctor, Daddy, are you? <laughs> so, so people aren't keen to, to meet us until they, they begin to understand our pain a little bit more. Okay. 
So what I'm going to do, I'm going to look at why symptom control is so important, who should be doing this symptom control, what sort of symptom control should be being done, how should it be done, and when should we do it. That's what I was going to, to do. Okay? In the what bit, we'll do some of the practical stuff. Is that all right? Why? Why? Why is this so important? Well, chronic illness is a journey made by an unwilling traveler. I think none of us would like to have to be recipients of the services that we deliver. Uh, but we want to make those services good. The challenges that we face, the demographic time bomb we've been made aware of. Did you know that a baby girl born in the UK in May, now has a life expectancy of 100 years. Isn't that frightening? That came from Radio 4. And this morning on Radio 4, there was also another frightening thing. A third of people in the UK have pre-diabetes. As I said, renal care, your future is secure. <laughs> Our older population, it's a different population who are being dialyzed now than who were dialyzed 20 years ago. The overlap with geriatrics, with elderly care, is, is, is never been more prevalent. Also increase in comorbidities, increased distress, less survival advantages, more ethical dilemmas, and less time available to manage multiple symptoms. Renal care is different from what it used to be. It's changing. It's on a journey. During dialysis, between 9 and 13 symptoms is what, is what the books say is the average number of symptoms. That's huge. 9 and 13 symptoms. The professionals, traditionally, because the machinery is just fantastic, what it does is just life completely altering They've got to get the knobs right. They've got to get the numbers right. They've got to do that stuff. And we need personalities who can do that stuff. I would be lousy at it. I would not let myself near a dialysis machine in a fit of Sundays. But you need the mixture of different skills, don't you? Patients also focus on dialysis. Uh, and often they, they put up with symptoms until... They get to the really late stage, uh, and then it all comes out, and their risks of having to leave dialysis are increased because they haven't presented their symptoms early. Blood results, ankle swelling, breathing. Yeah, we're happy to do that in dialysis land. But do you have the conversations about sleep, about sexual health? about appetite, about existential distress, whatever that is, or about social breakdown. Have you got the time for that? Are those things important? I think they are. And I think the other stuff is important as well. How do we manage this? When you look at a list of symptoms, you can realize that really we're covering the whole of medicine here in, in managing the symptoms associated with chronic renal failure. And that link between successful dialysis, successful renal uh, replacement therapy, and successful symptom management is absolutely intricate. If your patient's symptoms are not well managed, they will not stay on dialysis. If the dialysis is not done well, their symptoms will get worse. It's a, a constant interaction. We cannot ignore each other. I'm so glad you're sharing this space together. We've got to work together in this. Why? Well, all the age limitations of dialysis in recent decades have been removed. Fantastic. We heard about that as well. We've moved from the, from the age, you know, you, you, you can't have dialysis if you're over 60. Brilliant stuff. Now we can do dialysis. Fantastic. But now that we can, we're, we're, we're realizing that sometimes dialysis is not the best option. 
But though dialysis, we, there's lots of doubt about it, one thing we can be sure about is that we should always, always be managing distressing symptoms. Dialysis is an option. Managing symptoms isn't. Are you with me? Do you get me? <laughs> I get enthusiastic about these things. It, 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 it betrays a sad life, I think. <laughs> uh, why? What, in cancer care, we invest clearly, heavily in holistic assessment and management of symptoms. Should it be any different for patients with end-stage kidney disease? Uh, particularly when we know the mortality is worse than for most cancers, for those approaching dialysis. Survival rates are lower for end-stage renal disease than for cancer patients, and when time is limited, effective symptom control is even more important than when time isn't limited. <coughs> the close link between quality of life and effective symptoms, I'm not sure what quality of life is. Um, and I think you've got to kind of define it for yourself. Um, I, I've met patients in the hospice who are asking me how Manchester United did last night by winking, because that's all that they can do. And I've met a 17-year-old girl whose life is over because she's developed a large carbuncle on her nose. Yeah. Quality of life differs from person to person. <laughs> the symptom loads also differ. You can't just say, renal medicine, we've got these symptoms. Because with success of renal medicine, it's a journey. The symptoms which are there when you're on dialysis are different from the symptoms which are there when you're on conservative treatment, or the symptoms which are there when RRT has been withdrawn. Different. And so we've got to be selective a little bit about this. But you can see the huge amount of symptom load that's present. Patients with end-stage kidney disease are among the most symptomatic of any chronic disease group. But are we picking up those symptoms? And who should be picking up those symptoms? You know, who should be doing this? And how should they be doing it? If we go back to the the scary diagram, and you think of all these things, how many of these things do you, do you know much about yourself? I mean, uh, we've, we've heard about the, 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 the calciphylaxis, the, all the myocardial stuff, the neurologic. <coughs> it, who, could, who could claim to be an expert in all these areas? And, and so, so who is the person? We've got the patient in the middle there, with their average, say, 10 symptoms? Is it the nephrologist who should be looking after them? Or the GP? Or the general surgeon? Or the geriatrician? Or the psychiatrist? But what about a vascular surgeon? Or the respiratory physician? Who is the person who is holding this all together and managing this individual as opposed to managing disparate symptoms? Any ideas? Who can do this? Who is the one? <laughs> this is a kind of a question for Luke Skywalker, I suspect. But because it's, it, it is difficult. It is difficult. Need this. I'm already late. Somebody will come. Anybody out there? Do you have a phone? No. Sorry. Somebody! Hello! There are two people stuck on an escalator and we need help. Now, would somebody please do something? I don't believe this. You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> when you see somebody's got uh, chronic renal disease, do you feel relieved or 
I can leave that to the kidney people? Do you feel empowered? I can do something here. Do you feel scared? Um, it, often it can paralyze us. Uh, and there's something about that mix of machine and blood tests and all that stuff. For those of us who aren't comfortable in renal land, it, it scares us and we withdraw. And we, we, we fail to do the stuff that we clearly can do. And we become paralyzed. And the big hammer affects us all. And by the big hammer, I kind of mean the, the, the technology bit. The whiz-bang stuff, the stuff that just seems amazing when you're not involved uh, closely. It affects nephrologists because so much of your work is connected with that machine. It affects other specialties like palliative. Oh, we'll leave it to the... Uh, they, they're, going to have, they're going to be dialyzed on Tuesday. Sure, they'll sort out that problem when they're across there. And the patients, the patients are just so glad that they've been kept alive. They don't want to. They don't want to rock the boat. Uh, and this, if you only have a, one tool, and that tool is a hammer, then you tend to see every problem as a nail. And it can be that way with dialysis. That everything, because it's such a big part of people's lives, if you get a cold, it's due to the dialysis. If you get constant, you know, it, it just life evolves around dialysis. So. Why is it important? Well, there's a bit of disparity here in how people with renal replacement therapy or conservative therapy are treated. If people continue on dialysis, they're, they're followed up in, in renal land. If they're in conservative treatment, unless you have access to a clinic like an Antrim, you, you kind of get a variable follow-up. <coughs> and yet, these two populations of people have very similar symptom needs. That can't be quite right, can it? What, what should we be doing? What are the key symptoms? <coughs> Last uh, week, I was fortunate to visit uh, friends in Kenya. And the big thing in Kenya is the big five, the big five animals. What, what are the big five symptoms? Pain, anxiety, depression, Weight loss, fatigue. How many of your patients have I'm just too tired to continue on? Life has just become too wearisome. Itch, kind of soft symptom, but such an important one because it feeds into the lack of sleep and the weariness and the, yeah, all that stuff. And I thought, you know, well, well, what I do, I, I go kind of a run round each of those five and I'll tie it in with an animal, and it'll, it'll all look very colorful and that. I thought, actually, you can read all that stuff in a book. Uh, you, you really can. Um, so rather than doing stuff which is in the book or in your book or in the renal handbook, what I'd like to do is a bit of a scary thing, and that is, uh, well, let me preface it. I reckon... As a doctor, I learn much more from my mistakes than I do from my successes. In fact, I, 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 I learn very little when things go well. I learn a huge amount when things go badly. So what I'm going to do, I, I'm going to share with you the eight big mistakes I have made when looking after patients with renal disease. Okay? Is that all right? Yeah. I will feel better after this therapy. <laughs> Eight mistakes I've made in managing patients with renal failure. Maybe you can identify with them. Maybe you'll just think I'm thick. <laughs> Number one mistake. I've done this. I have written on a cardex without checking first what I really should be doing in terms of doses. I think it's about, about a dose, but I need to check. And there's fantastic resources out there which are easy to check. This is a really good friend. I have it on my computer. I have it in the doctor's room in the hospice. It's easy to use. It's authoritative. It makes me feel better at night. The BNF is really good, really helpful. 
good advice, clear advice. This little book, as you know, is just wonderful. And then there is the phone. Cultivate a good relationship with the person from renal land who you could maybe speak to. Their language is very similar to everybody else's. <laughs> but, but why not? It's worth a box of chocolates. It's worth a contact. It's worth a phone number. Developing that little relation. It's not your, your number of patients who you're going to share together is going to increase. Why not ask to go and spend a day in renal land? From hospice land or palliative land. Why not build a relationship? See what they do. See what they don't do. It, 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 that, that's possible. But firstly, check first. Check first. Now we're going to run a few tests. This is a simple lie detector. I'll ask you a few yes or no questions and you just answer truthfully. Do you understand? Yes. <laughs> what it, but it's true, I use that thing again and again and again, because bluffing kills patients. And I don't, please God, I haven't killed a patient, with bluff, but I have made patients sleep for far longer than what they needed to do because I didn't check first. The second major mistake is attributing all symptoms to chronic renal failure. A patient comes into hospice, they're, they're going, they have their dialysis, and I assume that this uh, pain that they've got is related in some way to their renal stuff. And so I, I, I don't go there. Because after all, they'll get sorted up, they'll get sorted whenever they go up to, uh, to, that, to Antrim to, to get their uh, dialysis. Uh, and yet, when you look at the symptoms which people have when they start, you know, at the start of dialysis, you see uh, angina, uh, myocardial problems, diabetes problems. These people are symptomatopaths. They've got lots of disease before they get anywhere near dialysis. So they've got lots of comorbid conditions for which people in palliative land have got lots of skills for helping. Uh, I think it's helpful to, to, to think in terms of symptoms in, in, in a, in a three-way category. Comorbid conditions, which tend to be the biggest volume of symptoms for patients. Secondly, there's, there's the reason why people are, are having dialysis in the first place, because of the complications of uremia, uh, the complications of kidney disease. And then there are the, the, the quite discreet but very important Symptoms which are directly associated with having dialysis, which we've heard something about, sometimes hypotension, sometimes acute pain, uh, sometimes <coughs> other particular issues, weariness following the, you know, the, the, the few hours following on from being dialyzed. Three different sorts of categories uh, and uh, areas in which we can help patients. So there's a risk that you, you see the renal label and you back off. But there's another risk which I've also uh, made a mistake with, and that's this one. Uh, well, so this, just an example was uh, the, the figures show that about 60% of patients with end stage kidney disease, whether they're on dialysis or not on dialysis, have pain. And look at the different numbers of, or different causes potentially of, of pain. Again, your categories, your comorbidities your uh, pain associated with renal disease and then your pains associated with actual dialysis and a lot of uncertainty as to what the cause of these pains might be. With such lists, we really have got to collaborate. No one has the answer to every one of these things, but with sharing and working together, I think we can grow in confidence in each other's expertise, what each other can do, what each other can't do, and we can deliver a much more rounded approach to symptom control for individuals as opposed to just managing symptoms. So the third 
big error I've done is the, is the converse. Not attributing symptoms to renal failure. I'm not going to do what I used to do. I'm going to just look at the whole person and the patient comes in and I do the whole history and the whole uh, palette of stuff. And I ignore the fact that they're completely knackered because their dialysis maybe needs to be changed or their hemoglobin is 6 or they haven't had proper iron deficiency treatment or their, their UNE is up the left. Um, you understand the point I'm mean, We've got to think in terms of together, together, in when we come to symptom management. Number four, very common one for me, is muddling symptom management in chronic and in acute situations. We see a lot of patients, don't we, in palliative land who come in with EGFRs beginning to fall. And 30, 20, 10, and but it's a, it's a dynamic situation. This is not chronic kidney disease. It's a, it's a different animal. And as a result, for example, um, we would use oxycodone quite a lot for patients uh, with EGFRs uh, in pain right down to you know, 30. Some would say, I think the, the figure, they're also licensing now even for lower than that. Um, and that's okay in the acute changing setup but there's no evidence out there for using oxycodone long term for chronic renal failure and there's a risk because you're used to using that sort of drug that you think oh that's okay it's, it, it, it's not going to accumulate but what about all the other problems associated with long term oxycodone oxycodone is the most abused drug in the states more people die from oxycodone than from heroin and smack cocaine in, in the States. So just because it's safe in the short term doesn't make it a safe thing long term. And then there's the issue of non-steroidals. You know, no, 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 can't go anywhere near non-steroidal in renal land or the renal physician will personally phone you up and complain. And yet that's not what... Or we have to kind of have that fear because that's been drummed into us. And yet, once the kidneys have been completely demonstrated to be non-working, there may well be a place for non-steroidals. So these absolutes, we've got to be less absolute about. And we do that by learning from other people's practice. And we do that by appreciating that there's different treatments for different stages along the journey, and black and white isn't kind of the main colors on that journey. You've got to make the colors to fit the patient at the particular time. Number four, I've made that mistake quite a lot. Number five, under-treating symptoms. This is a big confession for a palliative person. We're just supposed to ladle lots and lots of stuff on symptoms. But in that balance between worry about chronic renal failure and concern for optimum symptom control, often I'm more nervous about putting them, damaging them, respiratory depressing them, all those issues in chronic renal failure. And so I, I, I sometimes treat myself by not treating the patient. Do, do you understand the point I'm, I'm, I mean? And that's difficult. I, you, you don't want to be a cavalier doctor or a cavalier nurse who's just ladling stuff on them and creating lots of problems. But equally, to walk away from a patient who is still in pain because, because you're afraid that if you do anything more, you're going to cause significant problems I understand the walking I understand the, the concern but it's the walking away bit that's difficult <coughs> yeah okay so under treating symptoms I've done that and I haven't felt good about that and by and large I try to avoid that and I'm very fortunate in hospice land that we are able through good nursing education and good nurses to be able to use PRN medication uh, in, a, in, a, in a quite a, 
in a, in a sensible and a safe way. We don't get it right all the time, but um, we've got to, unless you're feeling some of that tension, I wonder, are you really doing the job well? Under treating symptoms, and then you guessed it, over treating symptoms. Are, are drugs which we're used to in palliative land, which we're comfortable with in palliative land, can suddenly become totally different animals in, in renal land. And um, so you, you've got to be careful there too. Uh, sometimes I, I have more confidence in managing symptom control than I, I have concern for the impact of renal fit. And so it's, it's that balance that balance. I think those of us who are working in the interplay between these two areas, we need to feel that tension. We need to worry a little bit. Have we overdosed a little bit? Because we, or we need to worry, why is that person still in pain? Can, can we get that balance? And that balance will differ from patient to patient. And involving the patient in some of these discussions can be really helpful. Because they will be able sometimes to be able to pitch, you know, if I'm a bit sleepier from this, is that what you want or is that what you don't want? Involve them. Involve them. Number six. Number seven. Making assumptions regarding sensitive symptoms. And I've, I've made mistakes here in two different ways. Uh, one way, because I'm such a holistic, caring doctor, uh, I can make the assumption that everybody's got an active sex life which clearly is going to be affected by their renal disease. So they need to have that conversation with me, if they want to have it. And believe it or not, there are people out there who do not want that conversation with me about those sensitive things. Um, so there's a risk both ways. One, ignoring things which are maybe they are sensitive to talk about, uh, but are really, maybe really, really important. Some of the patients who have been most grateful to uh, me in, in terms of man dealing with patients with renal failure have been ones where um, you've been able to discuss issues which, which are intimate and which they haven't taken the opportunity to discuss with other people. Uh, yeah, so... Um, uh, but... Equally, uh, we, we can't assume that everybody wants that sort of stuff. So what, what do you do with that? Uh, wh wh one of the things which, which I find helpful is that <coughs> if you're in a clinic or you're, you're with a patient and you're, you're not quite sure, I, I would, could put out a smogs board of different symptoms. You know, uh, are, are you concerned at the moment at all about it itching or have you worries about your family, or have you had any uh, intimacy problems or interest, uh, sexual concerns with your wife, or have you had any financial issues which have been uh, stirred up by the renal? Put out a list of stuff, demonstrating that you're willing to go there if patients want to go there, but giving them the option of picking them up or not. If you're not embarrassed about talking about those things, then there's a good chance that uh, uh, they'll be able to talk to you. So, uh, yeah. Lastly, under regarding soft symptoms. In, in, in palliative land, these are, are relatively soft stuff. They're not the hardcore pain, breathlessness, nausea, constipation, the stuff that we live and die by. <laughs> These are soft stuff. And yet in renal land, these, each one of these could be enough for someone to say, I've had enough, no more dialysis. These are significant symptoms. And we've got to take those symptoms really seriously for two reasons. One, because they're really serious to patients 
and two, because there's a lot of stuff that we can actually do about these things. There's a lot of literature, there's a lot of evidence, there's lots of stuff to try. We're not brilliant at it, but at least if you work with a patient through the list of potential options, you can actually do quite a lot. And for that patient to know that there's a, a, a nurse or a doctor who's concerned about these symptoms is, a, is, is in itself a big help. <coughs> so there's much that can be done. So how are we going to do this? How are we going to do this with the rising numbers, with the, uh, the, the cuts that extend north and south, with the lack of service development, etc., etc.? How are we going to do this? And we've already had some really good ideas this morning about how such a symptom management service could be delivered. Big one from Karen Ryan, the importance of developing generalist capacity. We, we don't need more specialist palliative care physicians. We need more physicians and nurses doing palliative care. <laughs> Get the difference? Yeah, yeah. Expecting and monitoring. We know that patients with chronic renal disease have got large volumes of symptoms. Are we monitoring them? We need to collaborate, not to create new services, but to work side by side. And where possible, to follow the, the excellent model. I was really excited to learn of what Jane McCauley and uh, the, the, the renal team in Antrim have been doing, creating a clinic where they, they meet patients together. And that infusion of palliative into renal and renal into palliative that, that's, that's the way to go. And then sharing information, key information. How do we make sure it's available and accessible? So generalist capacity, develop and encourage it. Really encourage it. To have a consultant uh, nephrologist do the certificate in essential palliative care is just fantastic. Brilliant. And she passed it as well. <laughs> <laughs> But, but I need to do the certificate in essential renal care. I'm not sure if I would pass it. But, but, but that stuff is important. Why is it important? Look at this. This is about training for nephrologists. A month of training to manage a dying patient. Remember the huge swing which has taken place in nephrology patients, dialysis patients? The vast majority now are old people. Um, my training in relation to, to, to managing dying nephrology, hardly any. You know, this, this has not been on the landscape of nephrology, and which is, I think, that's uh, really encouraging that that has been changed so rapidly. Another thing which which I think is really important. Uh, this was a, a study done. Uh, in surveys of patient satisfaction in dialysis units, which factor is cited most frequently by patients as the most important? The travel time to the unit, access to the consultant, the choice of SIF time, the duration of each dialysis center session, or the use of a dialysis chair rather than a hospital bed. Which do you think patients said was most important to them? Sorry? Shift time. Time. Travel, time. Travel, travel time, travel time, anything else? I can tell you, you're going to be surprised. The number one thing was access to their consultant. So much investment into this doctor who's keeping me alive. So much trust, so much placebo <coughs> power in that doctor's capacity. So if that doctor that team has got the facility, got the skills, got the knowledge, got the backup, got the support to manage symptoms. There is no better team on earth to deliver because there's so much investment in that service which is keeping me alive. I thought that was really interesting. Scary, but interesting. 
how expecting and monitoring, we've already seen a copy of this uh, monitoring chart, keeping a record of symptoms, even if it's just perfunctory, even if it's just using an iPad, even if it, you know, it's just tick, 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 tick. Why is it important? It's important because it allows red flags to be waved early. It allows you to highlight a patient where there's a trend going on. It allows you to get your symptom control in early or rather than before it's become established. Um, but there's a fear about this. It will create work. Yes, it creates work, but it also saves work down the line if you can cut people off, get to people before symptoms have become fully established. So palliative and renal collaboration, good stuff. But you might think that's just a kind of a dying thing. Uh, palliative and nephrology working together is not just about engineering good deaths. It's about working together for good symptom control, managing the kidney disease symptoms, the renal replacement therapy symptoms, and the comorbidities. It's about working together to understand personal goals of patients. It's about achieving the best possible functional status for patients. I was really glad to hear the physiotherapist speaking there. We know in cancer land now that exercise is such an important component of reducing the, the firestorm of cytokines which are part and parcel of chronic disease processes. If, you, if there's one thing that you can do for yourself in either cancer land or renal land, it is maintaining your muscle bank for the days when you will need it. Exercise, exercise, exercise. Avoiding no added value admissions to hospital. Really hard for some of our renal colleagues to do this on their own. Really hard for us to do that on our own, palliative-wise. Working together, we could maybe devise a, a, a better way to prevent this from happening and to improve the care experience for patients. So collaboration, really important stuff. Managing complexity with competent compassion. It's a good mix. And then supportive Clare care clinics. Antrim leading the way in Northern Ireland. Brilliant. Not just abandoning these people. We're not treating you anymore. Or, or rather, we're, we're giving you conservative treatment. Uh, see your GP. Come realizing that conservative treatment is as an active a process as dialysis, requiring every bit as much attention to symptoms as in the dialysis setting. Building good therapeutic relationships, absolutely crucial. And then we come to sharing information. This tattoo was on the chest of one of my patients. She didn't have confidence in the uh, transfer of her advanced care directive. So she, she, she took care of it herself or himself. Uh, it wasn't my patient at all. It was a picture from the internet. But, but <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, it's a nice story. We've got to share information. We've got to share information. And... One of the things that we've worked out up in the north with the public health agency is the development of a patient health passport which develops through the chronic disease process, not just at the dying time, in dementia, in renal disease, in motor neuron disease. A, a document that, that the patient can use to carry the key information which allows them to, to share that, not 30 times, or 40 times, or 50 times with each new professional, but they can just give the book over without having to repeat themselves. And then we've already heard about the electronic care record, which has made a big difference. We can now see patients' results, see uh, online. We're getting there in terms of sharing information so that 
we can make the best decisions possible. So when, when, when should we solidify our relationship? When should we refer to palliative care? Never. You know, if, if renal medicine were, were fully integrated palliative care, maybe they don't need to refer to us. Um, when there's a need for complex symptoms, yes. When considering the value of a hospice admission, yes. Uh, at patient family request, yes. When stopping renal replacement therapy and, and the family do not want that to be managed at home or there's problems. Yeah, but, but, but that said, I, I share some of Karen's misgiving about using the single tool, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the question, uh, with the surprise question. Um, because when you follow individual uh, renal patients, you will see that the surprise question may have popped up several times during their lives. You know, they were on hemodialysis and they were really sick and they had a transplant, went really well, and then they got really sick again. Surprise, surprise! You, you, you know, <coughs> and and you, you get the point. So it's, it's a different sort of journey. Uh, there is an, another issue here that if we in renal land, <coughs> and I was picking this up from nurses a couple of weeks ago, if we're not involved in kind of asking about the symptoms and all that stuff uh, for you know, months and years during the dialysis process, can we expect our patients to trust us or uh, if we suddenly become interested just around the end of lifetime? Uh, good palliative care is surely rooted in long-term relationships and not being parachuted in to fix things at the end. It's much better that palliative care supports the existing teams who are having those connections. Renal land or palliative land, I think we've seen these models, uh, realize the models, and the models are, are, are good and all of that, but models have got to be based around people. And some people will prefer very much the palliative approach. Some people will prefer to die in a nephrology unit because that's where they feel most comfortable, etc. Et and, you know, we've got to take account of people's preferences. Supportive care, though, is necessary regardless. The people have the appropriate information, necessary psychological support, the appropriate rehab, good GP involvement, social care, spiritual care, hospice care, if appropriate. So we need this together. Okay, coming to the end, you'll be glad. What have patients taught me uh, over the time that I've been losing my hair? Firstly, that symptom management in patients with chronic renal disease is never formulaic. The patients are individuals and the conglomeration of different symptoms, different treatments, makes it very hard to say, if I, I treat Mr. Smith like this, I should treat Mrs. Jones in exactly the same way. Chronicity, multiple comorbidities, com compartmentalized clinical systems. I'm sorry, you need to wait uh, to, to see the cardiologists for that problem. They affect symptom control for chronic renal patients. Third thing, dialysis technology often changes the dynamic of patient-clinician relationship. There's something about that huge machine and its complexity and its scientificness, which kind of is the elephant in the room often when it comes to doctor-patient, nurse-patient relationships. It changes things. I'm not saying it changes things for bad. I'm just saying it changes things. This is a quote from a patient. <coughs> Don't just treat my symptoms. Treat me. Treat me. And lastly, life and risk are inseparable. If you are involved in managing symptoms in patients with chronic renal disease, you will have to face risk. 
my wife works as a GP, and she's been really concerned with risk uh, in her training of trainees. And she's got a little article which she's putting together, and she's come up with this. The first law of risk thermodynamics. I present it to you for the first time. Risks in life cannot be created, cannot be destroyed. They can only be changed. What am I saying? I'm saying that all that you do, maybe to try to reduce risk, recognize that you, yes, you can reduce risk, but in reducing risk, you will also be creating new risks. Our job as nurses and doctors is to manage risk. If we try and eliminate risk, we will end up eliminating life. And your patient, who could still go out to Strangford Lock and fly fish, will never get that chance again because we haven't been able to manage that risk well. Risk management is a dynamic process. And so I invite you, whether you're a palliative care person or a renal person, to join the process of managing the risks of our patients so that they can live life to the full. Your risks are always evolving. Shouldn't your insurance stay in sync? Travelers.